It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Another day, another set of dance moves from James Rapine, rocking a new shirt. I'm Jake Lisko. He's James Rapine. We together are the Locked On Bengals podcast. Today, we've got another training camp update for you as the Bengals were back at it on Tuesday. Joe Burrow continuing his run of good practices. Some positive notes for the Bengals signal caller. We've also got an update with those notes on Jamar Chase, who, according to Dan Horde, had his best practice of training camp to date. And there's some clips out there. Check out Dan Horde's Twitter timeline for that. And maybe James Rapine's camp highlights over on the All Bengals YouTube page. You can check that out for daily highlights. Then we got some notes on the defensive line, some other training camp notes from practice on Tuesday. Larry Ogunjobi notably cleared for practice and, making an immediate impact going against that Bengals offensive, I should say, interior. We'll talk a little bit about how that went and some notable points for Cam Sample and Joseph Osai as well. And finally, uh, James, we should probably address the Jeremy Fowler report from ESPN indicating that Jesse Bates and the Bengals appear to not be close. But we'll save that for the end of the show and start with the good news, which is that Joe Burrow has supposedly had another nice day of practice, was relatively efficient in the team period today, led another touchdown drive. There was an interception I saw in the back corner of the end zone that Von Bell got to, and really good play for Von Bell. That's also in a clip on Twitter somewhere. But overall, it sounds like Burrow stringing practices together, looking more comfortable, and that's what's really important is that he's a little bit more comfortable. Yes, there's still some pressure. Yes, things aren't perfect, but sounds like he took off upfield again, had a nice scramble for potentially a first down if it wasn't a sack, depending on your perspective there, and some nice throwing efficiency as well. No doubt about it. For the the second straight, really third straight practice, but Sunday doesn't count because it was such a special teams heavy day. Really since Burrow admitted that he's human and that he has – this mental hurdle he's got to get over, he's gotten over it. And, and that doesn't mean he's completely gotten past it, but it feels like he's moved over it or past it. And maybe it was just admitting that the problem was the problem and, and that helped him fix it. Uh, and so far, so good. Joe Daneman's the one, by the way, who got that Von Bell pick. It was in seven on seven red zone. And uh, it was one of those things where I just think he, it's seven on seven. Why not throw it up? Because, but it was a good play by Bell. But yeah, overall, I think Burrow now has has showed that not only is he capable, capable of looking comfortable, but he's capable of doing it in a couple of straight practices. And that to me is the key here, because when I think back to his rookie year, when we would recap training camp, it would be eh, kind of shaky today, really good practice, eh, kind of shaky today, pretty good practice. And it, would, it was so inconsistent, but he would always respond. Well, what you're hoping for now is uh, he's a year wiser, certainly studied a ton of film. We understand all the processing and everything like that is as he gets more comfortable on the knee and mentally gets a little more clarity when it comes to that left knee, that everything else just opens up and, and you just start to see the potential of this offense. And I do think you did on that 11 on 11 drive, which you mentioned ended in a Joe Mixon touchdown run. Yeah, and apparently that was an impressive play, according to Paul Daner Jr. from The Athletic. One of the positive notes for the offensive line today with a good running lane cleared per Paul from Jackson, not Jackson Carmen, Billy Price, Xavier Suofilo, and Mike Jordan were the three on the interior in on that one. More on Mike Jordan coming up in a little bit because it was a bit of an up and down day there. Should mention that in light of Joe Burrow's relatively efficient day today, there was a lot of work on the screen game, and that's certainly part of it. There was some positive notes for Jamar Chase, though, coming out Mm -hmm. of this, including uh, easy separation against Chidobe Awuzie, getting open on a little out route in in the end zone for a pretty easy touchdown there. 
Sounds like he did some good work after the catch today on that 11 on 11 touchdown drive. So a nice day for Jamar Chase overall and a mm-hmm. nice day for the Bengals in both the short and intermediate game. It doesn't sound like there was a ton of deep work today, James. Is that fairly accurate and the success was coming in other parts of the field? No doubt about it, especially in the team periods. There was no deep balls <laughs> thrown in those. There was a couple during one-on-ones, and but outside of that, not much. And uh, I, I will say this, for all the talk about Jamar Chase's separation, he got a ton of separation against Darius Phillips in the intermediate game in one-on-ones. And then Chidobe Awuzie, like you said, and like Dan Horde tweeted about a, a video. I was on the other side of the field. Dan Horde had a better angle but uh, of, of him in that seven-on-seven seven red zone period. And that's the thing is it's not like Jamar is this straight straight line, all right, just go beat the guy guarding you, and that's what you're going to do. Like he wasn't that at LSU. Like he did some of that, but he's also going to be used in the screen game, which he was in 11-on-11, and I mentioned that on yesterday's show. You know, slants, little intermediate routes, and the big plays come when he breaks a tackle because his calf muscles are bigger than my waist and, and he goes after it. Right. And so that's, that's the part of it that we haven't seen yet. And once that happens and you see him break a tackle or two and make a big play after the catch, I think it'll ease some of these concerns or these worries that, uh, that some people have about separation or things like that when it comes to him being a successful NFL wide receiver. I should say that in addition to Jamar Chase having a nice day, there's a really fun highlight of T Higgins out there circulating as well a really nice dig route little double move kind of deal on a short in in breaker that was a pretty impressive play for t got really low got really low for a man of his size to break that route off inside quickly yeah and one quick note on t because i i know i yes scared some people uh when he he went down and, and he lo- appeared to injure his leg i mean he got up limping and, and, and it was uh, an ugly tight fall as he was diving uh, for a ball in seven on seven. And you're like, oh, I don't know. Well, he turned out to be OK. It looked like it was just cramps. Did come back for the next 11 on 11 period after getting stretched out. And I have to note this, Jake, because we, if we know to drop, we got a note, uh, no drop. I didn't see a Jamar Chase drop today. So Very that good. part worth noting because I, I've mentioned multiple drops before. So I should put that out there as well. Yeah, that's great news for him. And and also noteworthy on Higgins, not that this injury appears to be an injury even or anything serious, but left leg does set off some alarm bells for me, James, just because that's the same leg that he injured in week 17 last year, was battling that hamstring all season long. We'll see what happens tomorrow if he's back out there for practice today. Hopefully he doesn't tighten up overnight and he wasn't going on adrenaline or something. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it tomorrow, but it sounds like the the worst fears for T in that left leg have been avoided, which is great news. I think that losing any of these three wide receivers would be pretty miserable <laughs> at this point in training camp. So it's great that he's okay. And I guess, you know, as is tradition, James, tweeting a guy potentially hurt and, and he gets up and he's okay. So your your track record for guys that have gotten up and been okay when you put these little scary clips out on Twitter seems to be 100%. Well, that's good. I'll take that. I hope it's always that case, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you take that. Uh, You also take Larry Ogunjobi getting back from an injury. He's back at practice on Mm -hmm. Tuesday. A welcome addition to the Bengals' interior defensive line. Looking for that interior pass rush juice. We'll talk about some of his reps and some of the other noteworthy performances on the defensive line coming up next. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Maybe you're bullish on Jamar Chase after all of these reports. Seems a little iffy, right? Well, you could bet on him to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. Or maybe you think that Joe Mixon or Joe Burrow can be Comeback Player of the Year. Well, if it's any of those or any other NFL prop bets, why not wager at betonline.ag and make some money for your opinion Plus, they got you covered for all Major League Baseball, NBA, MMA, uh, anything you could ask for, you got it in one spot, betonline.ag. Plus, the NFL season, whether it's preseason games, regular season, Super Bowl odds in one spot. So get off the sidelines, get in on the action, and head to betonline.ag right now. Use promo code LOCKEDON to get 
a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, promo code locked on for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit at betonline.ag. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. James, Larry Ogunjobi back at practice. A pretty big deal, especially with the appearance that Trey Hendrickson is dealing with something. More mm -hmm. on that in just a few minutes here. But Larry Ogunjobi feels good, ready to be back out there. Sounds like he's excited to be back out there and immediately, apparently, making some waves, getting some nice push up the middle as a pass rusher. And you tweeted about this, James, specifically Mike yeah. Jordan, because we talked about yesterday. And, and some people think this idea is an overreaction, even criticizing the Bengals for, for putting Mike Jordan as the number one guard. Some people think that that idea is totally fine and should not be criticized at all. And as you've pointed out, if he was practicing well, that would be one thing. If Jackson Carmen was practicing well, that would be one thing. And it's not necessarily that they're practicing terribly, but there are plays, as you pointed out, specifically with Ogan Joby today, where Mike Jordan's having issues. Now, I, I sung his praises a little bit earlier. He was involved with a really nice rushing touchdown, a really nice lane for Joe Mixon. So good execution there. But the issue with Jordan has often been that he can flash that power in the running game and the inconsistency really rears its head in the ability to anchor and deal with power and stunts at times in pass protection on the inside. And that's what happened. I mean, Larry Ogunjobi beat him like a drum. And that's what I don't get with some of these people, like YouTube comments, even some tweets like, oh, well, Michael Jordan worked with Willie Anderson. With all due respect to Willie Anderson, that doesn't mean if you work with Willie Anderson, you're going to become Willie Anderson. And that's not Willie's fault. That's not even Jordan's fault. That's just the reality of how great he was. And Michael Jordan has had a rough camp. I don't think he's flashed. I said it yesterday, and that's why I tweeted that. I'm not trying to be mean to Michael Jordan, but there's just a lot of people that think that I'm just like dismissing him because of what happened last year or dismissing him after an offseason full of work. If he looked different, I would say it, and I'd love to say it. I, I don't want to keep talking about how this offensive line stinks and can't keep Joe Burrow upright and, and all of this stuff at the same time. Larry Ogunjobi just got back from injury. This is probably the worst he's going to be all week, <laughs> right? It was his first 11 on 11 session in how long? And he blows by this starting right guard, this guy who's lost this weight and is shiftier and better. And it's just, I wanted to point it out. And it's only one play. You're right. He was good on the, the mix and two yard touchdown run but you need some consistency and you need to know what you're going to get play in and play out. And that's, what's really hurt Michael Jordan over his first two years. And I feel like that's still the case as of right now, it can change, but would I go to betonline.ag and say, Hey, Michael Jordan, it's going to change. No, I would not wager on that one. And we'll see what happens in the preseason games, right? When it's <laughs> live football, another team, you know, 100% that, the object is to play a football game and to simulate a regular season game. Whereas in practice, we've discussed, that's not always the case. At, at this point, they are doing move the ball series. They're doing more real football simulation. And it sounds like that happened today. But a one-on-one -on -one is, is not a good way to evaluate an offensive lineman having issues against a defensive lineman. It's, it's just not how real football works. So we'll see. We will see. But it sounds like there's still issues with pressure and, you know, there will be issues with pressure at times. It's hard to quantify how much it's happening without, you know, detailed charting. And maybe you have that, James. Maybe it's something we could talk about in a future show. How many sacks do you chart on a given 11 on 11 period or something like that? You know, how many pressures do you chart or something like that? But without knowing that detail this could be anecdotal right this could be a couple plays here a couple plays there that stand out because offensive linemen do tend to you know as they as willie anderson for example has discussed they stand out when things go wrong and so we'll see what happens in the games right it's just something that this is a point of emphasis it's been a point of emphasis for you and i since you rejoined the podcast and 
we're still talking about it. Not only are we still talking about it, but like we're still talking about it to the point that Ben Baby, who covers the Bengals for ESPN, is saying he's never been around a fan base as I don't know if energized is a word, but as as interested in the minutia of offensive line play. And that's just kind of the reality of a Bengals fan right now. But uh, some other good news, I'd say, for the defensive line that we could talk about. Cam Sample had a really nice day today. Sounds like this was pointed out by Paul Daner Jr. And it sounds like he had a really good rep in particular against Jonah Williams. And I still think Jonah's a very fine player. So if, if Cam Sample starting to have some success there, that's good news. And fellow rookie Joseph Osai is standing in for Trey Hendrickson in 11 on 11s. Trey Hendrickson back at practice today in a limited capacity, but if there were practice reports right now, James, he would be indeed an LP. He would probably not be an FP because full participant because Joseph Osai was in there in the team portion of practice. No, he's certainly limited. And it's good in one way because you're getting Joseph Osai reps, right? And Osai is going to be a big part of this pass rush at the – uh, on the flip side, you want Trey in there at least some with the first team just so he can get acclimated to this new team because expectations are high for him. So it doesn't seem like anything serious. We'll ask Zach Taylor on Wednesday afternoon ex- what exactly it is. He kind of dismissed it the other day and just said, oh, he'll be back Tuesday. Well, now it, it was Tuesday and Trey was back technically in full pads, but not full go. So we'll get more on that from Zach. Uh, as far as Cam Sample, it was the first time, and damn it, Jake, it, it's flash. I keep using the word flash, but I think it's the first time he did show what he was capable of. And I actually tweeted out, and, and you could check it out on Twitter. It was during the non-video portion. So all these 11 on 11s, the reason you don't see video, we're not allowed to video. But I took pictures of Burrow in their tight pictures. I can't take pictures of formations and stuff. But uh, I put three pictures out there, and you can see Cam beat Jonah Williams and get past Jonah. And it looks like Jonah might get called for a hold and he would have sacked Joe Burrow. I certainly gotten close to it and, and at least forced a throw away. So really good rep. That was the, the one that really stood out. Cause you're talking team, you're talking lined up against arguably the best offensive lineman on the team. And uh, he handled his own. It was that one rep, uh, which can happen to any offensive lineman, right? So I'm not trying to scare people about Jonah. I think he's been pretty solid this training camp. But uh, it's a good sign for for Cam Sample, who was limited at the, at the start of camp, obviously, with that hamstring. Yeah, hopefully he's getting back to health and continues to find some success throughout the rest of camp, throughout the preseason. On the topic of the offensive line, before we get our daily kicker update, we had some interesting comments from Duke Tobin. And the other day I speculated, James, about whether Zach Taylor's praise for Deontay Smith was perhaps a veiled message to Jackson Carmen about, you know, hitting your weight and being a pro progressing every day, taking Mm -hmm. it, you know, seriously as a job. And and this isn't to say that Jackson Carmen isn't, but Duke Tobin today specifically calling out Carmen and saying, he's got to get himself into better shape essentially, which has been a bit of a theme at this point throughout training camp. It has, and it's it's extremely concerning that this is an issue. And I know it's it was an issue at times, and Carmen had weight issues at times in, in the past, specifically college, right? But you're talking about a guy that they picked and traded down to get and were so high on and call people in Jacksonville. I asked Tony Wiggins how Walker Little's doing in Jags camp right now. Everyone focuses on Tevin Jenkins. It's not just Tevin Jenkins. Think about all the guards that we were talking about during draft time, right? Ben Cleveland was was a a hot name at the time. And there was just all these guys, and I'm not going to get into them. But all these names, Jake, and that was their guy. And they had intel from Willie Anderson and Paul Alexander, and that's their guy. And all of these things need to line up, and they really need to protect Joe, and they believe he could come in. And not only has he struggled for camp or in camp, But he's not even in shape. Like, could you imagine how much we would crush Jamar Chase? And I get it, 46th pick versus 5th pick. But if Chase wasn't working hard in these struggles, and I say that in quotes, were happening, like Chase stayed after practice for 25 minutes minimum 
on Tuesday. I took some clips of that because I just think he's he works his ass off. And so if a guy's doing that and he struggles some, well, then you believe he can turn it around. And it just doesn't feel like that's what Jackson Carmen is doing. He might be behind the scenes, but it just feels like he's not. It feels like he didn't come in uh, into camp the, at the best shape. It certainly looked that way. And I don't want my second round pick that – returned home and it's this homecoming i want him to be motivated to live up to the expectations of playing in front of a hometown crowd not wilt and i'm not saying he's wilting but damn it get in shape it's not that crazy and it's not that crazy of an expectation to expect that and and i think that's what duke was saying without saying it the way i just did this team has consistently used a mantra of doing things the right way and there seem to be some subliminal messages out there indicating to Jackson Carmen that the way you're doing it isn't the way we want you to do it. And we're guessing we're reading between the lines. We could be way off here and maybe he is doing the things he needs to do. We'll find out very shortly and we'll find out if he's starting come the regular season. There's only a few weeks away. We're going to get that Evan McPherson update to you in just a minute. And we're going to wrap up today's show with the Jeremy Fowler report on Jesse Bates and that contract extension that's coming up next. Jackson Carmen isn't the only one that wants to get or needs to get in peak shape. We all want that, right? Whether we're a professional athlete or an insurance salesman built bar can help you get there. You hear me talk about them all the time. They're the number one protein bar on the planet because there's something for everyone. They taste great and they're gonna fit your macros. They have nine great flavors, plus the occasional limited time flavor. They're covered in 100% chocolate, so they taste like a candy bar. And the best part, they're macro friendly. High in protein, low in calories, low in sugar, perfect for you. So check them out right now. Go to built.com, see all of the different flavors, pick out a couple, maybe try a mixed bag, and. When you do, make sure you use promo code LOCK15. You're going to get 15% off your first order. Again, go to Built.com and use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off. Evan McPherson, making field goals, James. (laughs) What was the nickname you had for Is this something the beat writers are using at camp? No, I just made it up on the uh, Money Mick. Money Mick. Let's see Is if that it sticks, it? right? Yeah, uh, money yeah, Mick, that's what maybe. Is, yeah, money, money from 50. Money Mick. He kicked uh, six field goals at the end of practice on Tuesday. <laughs> he made five of them. His only miss coming from 54 yards. He made three field goals from 50 plus and two others in the mid, mid to low 40s. Evan McPherson continues to say, Jake, shut up about the value of drafting kickers. I'm good. And obviously he's not <laughs> concerned about this lockdown Bengals podcaster, but it's just fantastic to get these consistently positive updates on Evan McPherson. I'm excited to get to watch him kick in the preseason, watch him boot some kickoffs through the end zone, kick some nice field goals because everybody's raving about his power. And I don't actually, like, even the good Bengals kickers in the last 10 years or so haven't been known for their power. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of exciting to have a guy that's got a bit of a extra juice in that leg. No doubt. James, let's Andy. wrap up with uh, sorry to cut you off. Let's wrap up with the Jeremy Fowler report because this one's going to have some back and forth to it. Yeah. We've talked sure. a lot about Jesse Bates and signing with the super agent and potentially resetting the safety market. And the report today indicates that the Bengals and Jesse Bates are not close to an extension. It's not going to get done, quote unquote, anytime soon. And to me, it will be shocking if this doesn't eventually get done. I tweeted this. I would be beyond shocked if the Bengals don't eventually figure this out. And if it doesn't get figured out, it's frankly inexcusable. There's no good reason this doesn't happen. But as you point out, James, maybe he's just asking for like 50% more money than the next highest paid safety. And that's what the Bengals are balking at. I just wonder what the negotiations are like. And fans are obviously quick to crush the Bengals. And this happens all the time. I mean, I I remember uh, my man, Rick Uccino works at 700 WLW talking to me about Vontez perfect 
and I know it's completely different circumstances, but before he got his extension and he was like, just sign him. And, you know, because if you come from an emotional state, you know, state, look, Jesse Bates is different than that. And I'm not comparing him to Vontez perfect. And he should be the face of this defense for the next five to seven, hopefully next decade. Right. At the same time, it's a negotiation. And that's how I take that report. I'm not freaking out. I'm not losing my mind. The negotiations are about leverage. They're about blinking. They're about bulking. They're about public, all that stuff, and public sentiment, all of that. When you have something like this that uh, is in the eye of fans and, and, and is under a microscope. So Jesse Bates wants to be in Cincinnati. The Bengals want him. There's got to be a price that's fair that they can find, a middle ground that they can find, because that's the key. Everybody wants to get paid more. Everybody. Even if you're Trey Hendrickson, you think you should probably make more, but you find a middle ground and a ground that you can agree to, and that's that. And so hopefully they can do that. That being said, if a defense that has brought in DJ Reader and Trey Waynes last year, and then you go out this year and you get Chidobe Awuzie and Mike Hilton, and you just continue to revamp things with Trey Hendrickson, and you extend Sam Hubbard, and you bring in Larry Ogunjobi and you can't get a deal done with Jesse Bates, who's better than all of them, then that's a problem. And so I, I see that point as well. Yeah, and, and it's not to say that that's not going to happen, right? I, I think that you and I both probably think it's more likely that this deal gets done than it doesn't get done. It might not be before the regular season, though. No, That is something that I didn't necessarily expect before today and before this report. But there's always a possibility that this is agent leaking things to try to get a little bit of leverage in the negotiation. Because as you mentioned, James, public perception definitely plays a part in this. But I mean, thinking back in, in Bengals history, I'm trying to think of a time when the Bengals let somebody get away when there wasn't a backup plan. There's There wasn't a guy they had on the roster that they felt good about. You know, you think about Mike Mike Johnson and Carlos Dunlap. They got one mm -hmm. of those two guys, Leon Hall, Jonathan Joseph. They got one of those guys. I guess maybe you could go back to the wide receivers, Muhammad Sanu and, and Marvin Jones. They didn't necessarily have the in-house solution there, but is there a guy, Justin Smith, maybe? I, I don't know. Is there a guy in recent history where there wasn't a backup plan already on the team when the Bengals had interest in getting it done and just said, you know what? We're, we're just not going to hit the price tag? I don't know. I mean, people are going to say Whitworth, right? No, um, they had the backup plan that they thought it, existed. It wasn't a good backup plan, but that yeah. was their thought process, I think. I, what would you say? Would you do, um, uh, what's his name, Zeitler? Would you say that? Do you think they had a backup plan for him? What happened after Zeitler? That was so long ago that I can't remember exactly what happened there. Well, well I'll, I'll answer. They didn't, but they had bowling, right? And so they kept him, I believe, right? And, and I think that there's, there's some history of the guard position there as well. And I don't know that the Bengals, like, I don't know how interested the Bengals were in bringing Zeitler back. Whereas, you know, Jesse Bates is this veritable superstar face of the defense. Mm -hmm. Zeitler was a, a piece, a key piece, and somebody that I think they should have kept but, you know, they, they never really prioritized it and they've never really prioritized the position. So that one would make a little more sense. And here's the thing that we don't know about the negotiations, too. Like the Bengals might be offering him a four year, 16 million per $40 million guaranteed. And that might be a bit high. $35 million guaranteed, which is more than Justin Simmons got from Denver type deal. But what if uh, his agent? And I'm going to butcher his last name, but it's David Moletta or something like that. And sorry if I butchered your name, David, if it's not intentional, I just don't know it exactly. Um, uh, what if he's like, man, the cap's going to go up, Jesse. You're 24. You're younger than Burrow. Uh, another year on this defense, you're going to become an even more, uh, more of a face, not only on the Bengals, but in the NFL. You, you could become a star. Because I don't think Jesse Bates is a star yet. He's a star in Cincinnati and among Bengals fans. I don't think a lot of – a lot of people know him outside of like diehard NFL fans, right? If you're in LA, do you know who Jesse Bates is? Probably not. But if he plays at an all pro level this year, cap continues to rise. Could he crack the $20 million mark? And so maybe if you're Bates, agent, you say, I want 20 million per now, because that's what we're going to do 
And if you're the Bengals, do you balk at that? I, I don't know, but I, I'm just trying to, cause that's what negotiations are. Right. And I wonder how far apart they are. It sounds like they're really far apart. And, and I just wonder on which end is it is one side yeah. being unreasonable. I, I just, I don't think the Bengals would offer him 12 million per, I just doubt that they would, they would be doing that with a guy like Bates. That, that, Given the agent that he hired, the way they talk about him consistently as the best safety in football and social media, I just, I know it's social media, but like, I can't imagine that they're really lowballing him. I could imagine the opposite scenario, James. And that is very interesting. Maybe there's a, a situation here where Bates is actually posturing for the franchise tag to play on a one year deal and wait for that cap increase to hit. Mm hmm. It's a little uncomfortable to think about. Could be the reality. I, I certainly, if I'm the Bengals, I'm trying to get it done and trying to see, you know, maybe he's asking for 20 and you come in at 18. Or maybe he's just waiting to see where Jamal Adams and some of these other safeties set the market and he's looking for a little bit more than that. And we'll have to see what those deals shake out to be. I can't bring myself to get really concerned about this yet, though, because even if they don't get the long-term extension done, they do have the franchise tag in the back pocket. That's mm -hmm. always an emergency option. And I, I just, again, I, I think it's more likely than not that this gets done. And it's in the long run, a blip in the history of the Bengals when we look back on today. I, I agree. And the other thing I'll mention, obviously Bates said, quote, he's super eager yeah. to sign an extension. The other thing he said, and this matters, because it, it, let's say that scenario plays out where he's playing on the franchise tag, playing on uh, last year of his rookie deal, then he gets tagged next year. And, and his plan is just to kind of play it out. He mentioned how he's waiting on this extension to move his mom from Fort Wayne to Cincinnati. And, and so like, if you have plans like that in the back of your mind, I don't think you're okay. I'm going to play this out and go sign a mega deal two years from now when again, he'd still only be 26. So he would still get a mega deal if he played well and stayed healthy at the same time. Why would you want to risk that? Especially if you're, you're already envisioning moving your family to Cincinnati and, and having this different lifestyle, this life changing money that you'd get with an extension. Keep your good players. We've talked about <laughs> it before. It hasn't always gone the way we'd like, but this is one where I think the Bengals and both of us, see eye to eye the Bengals are back at practice on Wednesday we've got a game we're gonna do a game preview this week James are you ready yeah. to do a game preview man I can't wait I'm Until a big Tom time, Brady Bengals, fan so yeah he's is he gonna play I don't think he's gonna I play know. he I wouldn't play him he's he's three times older than Joe Burrow why the hell would he play <laughs> 60 70. I can't do math. 72 year old Tom Brady, not going to play. You heard it here first from James Rapine. That's going to do it for this episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. We're back tomorrow with Wednesday's practice recap. Until then, Bengals fans, who day and have a good one.